In the mid 80s, Minolta was a pioneer in the development of autofocus technology. And though I'd never used a Minolta camera, they were a fairly distinguished company founded in 1928. The Maxim 7000 Dynax in the European market, released in 1985, was arguably the first viable autofocus camera. Now the Nikon F3 AF uh, appeared in 1983, and though Pentax MEF and Chinon CE5 had already shown autofocus single lens reflex cameras, autofocusing couldn't be achieved without the use of purpose-made motorized autofocus lenses. So the Maxim 7000 with AF sensors and focusing motor inside the camera body made it possible to make lenses smaller and less expensive than equivalents from Nikon and Pentax. Meanwhile, I was happy with my Nikon bodies and manual focus lenses, so I'd really paid little attention to these developments at the time, other than to <laughs> doubt that technology could anticipate where I wanted to place my focus. Um, and here's something I've wondered recently. The Canon Eye Following Autofocus, uh, Eye Control AF, they call it, uh, maybe someone who's used it could comment. When I'm composing my eyes constantly scanning the border of the frame to hopefully include that which um, I want in the composition and to exclude what I don't. That's the intent anyway, <laughs> and I often fail. But um, wouldn't Canon's technology assume I wanted some peripheral area in focus? As I say, I haven't tried a Canon camera that uses this, but from my research, um, it debuted in 1992 the year after the Minolta Maxim 7XI, we'll get to that camera in a minute, it came in the EOS A2E EOS 5. And Canon admits the nascent technology wasn't exactly a success, but presumably it's a lot more mature in something like the EOS R3. Anyway, I'd appreciate hearing from someone who has experience. But back to the Minolta Maxim 7XI. It had something called iStart, which couldn't be switched off uh, on that model, I think. And it was an early version, I guess, of the sensors now used to detect, say, when we put our eye to the camera's eyepiece. <laughs> Some of us still do that. <laughs> to switch between the LCD screen and EV. Uh, and I recall it being irritating. One of the reasons I wasn't entirely sold. Uh, but it did have other amazing for the day innovations like TTL flash metering. Um, exposure compensation uh, plus minus four stops, AF illumination lamp, inbuilt flash, DX coded speed, um, as well as a custom override for that, ISO 6 to 6000 film speed. Uh, more on its features later, but to the story of how I became the owner of a Minolta 7XI. In 1991, I participated in something called Vancouver's Vancouver a group show produced by Urban Photographic Projects. And the juried exhibition turned out to be a great experience for me. Several of my photographs were accepted, including the Bible Society 1981, South Moresby Caravan 1986, and Wooden Roller Coaster Vancouver 1986. And the first two of those photos assumed unusual lives of their own, as I've described in another video. But it was the roller coaster that won second prize in the black and white category. And regular visitors to the channel will be familiar with that story. I received a generous cash award and the prize included a couple of thousand dollars worth of camera gear from sponsor Minolta. Air Canada, Acura, the Vancouver Sun, Hotel Vancouver, radio and TV stations and a slew of other companies also backed the event. So I took home a newly minted Minolta Maxim 7XI camera zoom lens, flash, and accessories, and rifling through my uh, filing cabinets researching for a previous blog post that I've adapted for this video, I discovered a packing slip for a half dozen program cards delivered after the awards in October 1981. And these data cards fitted into a slot in the side door of the camera, something like today's digital media, and they could be enabled with a button uh, on the top panel of the camera. I received cards for customized functions, multi-spot metering, uh, fantasy effect, <laughs> flash bracketing, background, and multi-exposure. 
And the retail on these things wasn't cheap at $55 a pop. So with an extra $25 lithium battery, that made another $355 a of swag. <laughs> the 7XI was a beast, rivaling the size of modern day DSLRs. It incorporated another innovation, an LCD data screen also mounted on the top panel, something that's become standard on many digital cameras today. I guess I didn't prize my prize that highly though, since I only kept it for a short time. In fact, I sold it to buy more manual lenses for my Nikons. For whatever reason, I sacrificed program aperture priority, shutter priority modes, 14 segment matrix metering, automatic film loading, shutter speed up to 1 8,000th of a second, and of course, auto focusing with its fuzzy logic, program sensors. <laughs> All four of them. It would be three or more years before I embraced autofocus, which had become commonplace, though not always faster than manual focusing. I bought a Nikon F90X, but I kept my manual bodies, at that time, two Nikon FM2s. The TTL flash was another wonder that I really didn't trust to replace fill flash calculations <laughs> that were stored between my ears. Jeez, what an arrogant fool. Certainly, the autofocus proved itself when I look back through contact sheets from the shoots with the 7XI. The TTL flash filled without looking obvious, exposure is spot on, and the whole experiment seems to have focused my eye on the street at the time. The negatives from the tests have resided in my archive for 32 years. And again, when I look at the results now, I wonder why I didn't give the camera its due. Perhaps because of shortcomings mentioned in various reviews of the day, as well as recollections uh, like this. Controls were hard to access, it had a sort of strange mix of prosumer and amateur features, and again its size, huge compared to my relatively compact Nikons. In 2003, the year I bought my first DSLR, a Fujifilm FinePix S2, Minolta merged with Konica Corporation to form uh, Konica Minolta. Three years later, Konica Minolta announced that it was quitting the camera business and sold a portion of its SLR camera business to Sony. And we know that Sony built on Minolta's pioneering camera tech to itself lead in the area of autofocus, as it pushed especially into the mirrorless space more recently. Obviously, I got over my aversion to what was originally a pretty slow autofocus. Um, with that purchase of the F90X in 1994, I eventually owned two of those and I still have the last one I bought in 2001, the year it was discontinued. Incidentally, the F90X was used as the base for the, I think it was 1.5 megapixel Kodak DCS 400 series of digital SLRs, released the same year. But I couldn't afford the $11,000 price tag. <laughs> I still initially used my collection of manual Nikkors with the F90X. But I think I first replaced my 24mm f2.8 for its autofocus equivalent. But I'm often impressed by what I used to routinely pull off with manual focus lenses. We accomplished that most often by anticipating where the subject would be, pre-focusing, um, the use of smaller apertures, hyperfocal distance, f8 was always a safe bet. And coincidentally, the sweet spot for lens sharpness in a lot of lenses. Now it's a neglected skill and I struggle today to achieve the same kind of results I see in my older shots or when for instance I'm out with retro manual lenses like the TT Artisan 50mm f2 which I recently reviewed. I'm really blown away by today's autofocus and tracking innovations in cameras like the Nikon Z9, Z8 and uh, most recently ZF, a superb street and travel camera. And I'll be showing more from the ZF uh, uh, as my use and results from that camera accumulate. Whereas 40 years ago, one of my approaches to street photography was tripod mounted cameras with slow film, small apertures and long shutter speeds to blur moving subjects. Now this worked especially well with medium format cameras and I've reprised that occasionally since with the use of ND filters on 35 millimeter. But now with these amazing autofocus advancements, we can confidently shoot at razor thin depth of field with say Nikon's 50 and 85 millimeter f1.2 lenses using super fast shutter speeds in daylight that freezes action while nailing focus. And it goes without saying that today's autofocus subject tracking and specific subject recognition is something 
that we didn't dream of uh, back in 1990. When it comes to my Nikon cameras, that includes animals, birds specific that came to the Z9 with firmware 4.1, vehicles including cars, motorcycles, bicycles, oh, and planes in that same Z9 update. But all this evolved directly from that early research and development. Again, I do enjoy occasionally <laughs> retesting my rusty manual focus skills. But I have to admit, um, and I did admit it in a video I made um, a year or two back, that I have to be willing to miss shots <laughs> because cameras are now way smarter than me. Um, and isn't that what's always driven technological advancement uh, to extend our skills and improve our work? So I'd say that while autofocus isn't an absolute necessity, we all have it now, and it sure turned out to be the mother of invention. I remember it took quite a bit of studying the manuals to get up and running with the 7XI, having been used to um, strictly manual cameras. Um, so I chose the Nikon FM deliberately in those days as a fully manual camera, and the only thing the battery does in the FM is run the light meter. Uh, so there was quite a learning curve with a 7XI. Um, and I was something of an <laughs> ornery old fart in those days. I don't need no stinking autofocus. And in the end, I really wasn't convinced by the newfangled technology at that point. But damn, I wish I still had that Minolta though, even if it's just for its historic importance and to put on the shelf alongside the F90X. I still have the Yashica T3, actually it's Amanda's, as per the shot of me studying the 7XI manual. And I encouraged her to buy the T3 after her camera was stolen in 1989, the year that we met. Not to forget the T3 has a 16 zone autofocus system activated with a half press of the shutter. And I always love borrowing that camera. It's so easy to point and shoot. And that's where we are now really, point and shoot I mean, with cameras like the ZF that track subjects, even with a manual lens attached. So what a time to be a photographer. I feel younger than ever <laughs> in that regard, but if only I had the same stamina that I had 40 years ago, um, or autofocus had come of age sooner. Well, I had enough energy <laughs> to finish this video on schedule, uh, my own that is, and I hope you found it interesting and maybe a little entertaining. If you did, please do give it the old thumbs up. And if this is your first time here, please do consider subscribing. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. In the meantime, take care. Cheers, and we'll see you later.